Well, good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. May I ask everyone present to turn electrical uh, devices to silent so they don't interfere with proceedings. Now, we've received apologies from committee member Gordon MacDonald. Um, item one is a decision <coughs> by the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> we turn now to our inquiry on construction of Scotland's economy, item two on the agenda. We have uh, with us today a number of witnesses, all of whom I would welcome, and also to advise that there's no need to press any buttons on your sound desk. That's all operated from the, the sound desk. So if you want to come into the discussion, simply indicate by raising your hand. Um, so, first of all, we have Graham Dodds, Director of Operations for Jacobs, then David Stewart, who is Policy Lead for the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Mark Dixon, Director of Capital Investment Scottish Water, Peter Rieke, who is Chief Executive of Scottish Futures Trust, and Soren Jensen, who is a Senior Policy and Research Advisor of um, CUST, uh, which is the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. So, a welcome to all five of you this morning. And I'll hand over to the Deputy Convener, John Mason, to start with some uh, questions. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. And uh, the first area I wanted to touch on was the whole question of the project pipeline and what uh, guidance, as I understand it, the Government is giving a kind of overview of the amount of money and the number of projects that they're expecting uh, in the coming years. So I'm, I'm interested in your views as to how useful that is, or are there gaps in there? Would you like it to go further ahead? Would you like more detail? Would you like other sectors to be in there that aren't currently in there? I don't know if anyone's got some strong thoughts, wants to start on that. Mr Stewart's looking interested? Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to start. Um, I should perhaps start by saying I'm not a, an expert on infrastructure, so I'd be proposing to talk more about planning programmes for housing, but obviously infrastructure has a role. But um, as far as um, affordable housing goes, um, obviously there's a 50,000 target for affordable homes, which is extremely welcome. Uh, there's been a uh, grant planning targets for local authorities set out for three years. So actually, as far as both clients and contractors being able to plan for work, um, I would say over the period of the current parliament, we're in a good situation and that, that's extremely welcome. It's not always a a situation that we've been in previously. Could I just clarify then? I mean, housing is not, am I right in saying housing is not included in the project pipeline that the government produces because the housing is, in details, decided by other bodies? Yes, I, I believe that's the case. Right, okay. But we've still obviously got a pretty clear target on housing. Yeah, right. yes. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, anyway, Mr. Rieke? Yeah, so the, you'll know that the Infrastructure <coughs> Investment Plan, the Scottish Government last published in December 2015, and there was an update. Um, published in April 2018, and, and that includes nearly a billion pounds worth of, of project opportunities which hadn't started construction at that stage. And so that looks at the high value projects across all sectors that have a government involvement in them. But most infrastructure investment, as you've alluded to, is done by local authorities and, and other bodies, whether it be housing associations and others. Um, so. There's also on the government's page, there's a click through to SFT's pipeline, and we published a pipeline looking ahead for the hub program, which as you know, that's a, a program that we manage in SFT. But again, that doesn't cover everything that local authorities and others are doing. So we know that in 2016, in its follow up report on major capital investment in councils, Audit Scotland identified at that stage that a third of local authorities published forward looking investment plans. Um, and, and I don't know whether that proportion has changed since Audit Scotland last looked at it, but they, they did recommend that, that there was more information published on that by local authorities at that stage, I think. So th there are high-level plans published by government and different bodies do publish their own plans, but I sort of agree with the premise that there's no single place to look for all investment across everybody that procures infrastructure in the public sector across Scotland. 
I mean, I suppose it doesn't matter if there's not a single place as long as everybody has access to all that information. That's right. So, I mean, from SFT's point of view, do you have access to all the information you need? I mean, you're obviously closer to government than some other witnesses, I think. Yeah, so, so the, the plans that are published give a good look ahead. I think many people in industry have said that more pipeline information would be more useful, and that's always going to be the case. People would always want to be able to look further ahead to plan their resources, but the, again, industry witnesses will be better placed on this than I, but there's, there's, it's one thing knowing what's coming, but it's quite another thing knowing that your organisation is going to be part of what's coming and, and win tenders, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think there is good information on the, um, the overall volume of activity, pretty good information on what sectors it will come in, and then you have to start looking in different places for individual projects. And, uh, and again, there's a tension there because... Uh, if, if there was a central place where all of that was published, then every contractor from anywhere would be able to click on it and see what, what work was coming in every area across the country. As we have local authorities publishing their own information, that arguably makes it easier for local contractors to have a view about what's coming locally, which some local contractors, I think, might see as, as a good thing. So the, there are various different... I think everyone would like to see more information published and, and how far ahead. That's challenging with budgets and so on and so forth. But exactly where it's published and whether it's all centralised, I think there are different views on, on how that would best be done. OK. Thanks, Mr Jensen. Yeah, so obviously I'm, I'm providing a bit of an outsider's uh, perspective here, but, but from the international uh, point of view, uh, I'd very much agree with what, what Peter had just said about... Um, you know, the different ways of making things transparent. And we actually found in, in our case study that on Scotland that was published last year that Scotland has a very high level, uh, both in comparison to, to the UK generally and, and also internationally, of infrastructure transparency that is uh, data that is disclosed throughout the, the project uh, delivery, uh, both for uh, large projects above uh, 20 million pounds and also uh, where the level of transparency was 95% uh, uh, measured against the infrastructure data standard and for projects between uh, 4.5 and 20 million uh, it was 70% uh, of the infrastructure data standard. However, even what, what the, the drawback on this is that it is a bit fragmented and scattered across different uh, websites, different reports, so you do need to invest a considerable time in finding this information. And that, I think, lowers the, the, the value of it, both for, both for contractors, but also for, for citizens uh, in general who are interested. Okay, thank you. Mr Dodge? Thank you, Deputy Convener. The, I, think, I think part of what Peter referred to is that industry will always want the pipeline to be as detailed and as long as possible, because that gives us surety in our investments uh, in our people. We understand, though, that there's a, there's a practical limit to how far that can go. So the, the pipeline that exists at the moment is um, relatively good at telling us what's being constructed and about to be constructed. It's probably less good at pointing out the stuff that's, that's coming um, and, and albeit those have a certain degree of probability about them because some of them will require funding decisions still to be made. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a tension there between what you're able to say definitively and what advice you can give industry on, on what may be coming up um, to allow industry to make, make judgments. And industry understands that probability piece. It's what we, we do all the time in, in looking at our, our forward order book. We look at probabilities of, of what we may win. I think Peter referred to we don't win everything, obviously, but we look at probabilities and, and think about our order book in, in that sense. Um, I think the points made by other speakers are right about the fragmented nature once you go away from the infrastructure plan. One point I would make in relation to that is that Relative accuracy is important for industry. So what we wouldn't want to see is an expansion of the plan which degraded the accuracy of that. So it's important that either there's a degree of governance across what's being put into any published plan, which I think we have with the infrastructure plan at present, um, or that there's an understanding or a threshold of, uh, of certainty that the agencies need to meet whether that be at national or local level, in order to, to give the industry surety about what's coming forward. 
So if you took something like the A9, which I think is quite a long-term plan, um, I mean, well, you could sit down on day one and say, well, this is what we're going to do in that year and year two and year three and year 20. Um, but, I mean, year 20 then, in all likelihood, would, would just change. So um, I, I'm struggling to know. I mean, do you, do you think we should be trying to plan further ahead, even if we're uncertain about it? Or? I, th I think it's that kind of diagram that has... I'll declare an interest in A9, obviously, because okay. we're, we're involved. But I think there's a cone that one can see that as you, as you move further out, the certainty becomes less... But it's a conveyor belt system in that sense, so that as as we move forward in time, the certainty about where certain elements of project lie on that become become greater. So I think I think trying to um, in some way uh, reflect on that uh, would be useful for industry. We understand that that you know anybody who says we know what's happening in five years' time on that is probably. It's difficult to say that that's, that's got a degree of accuracy about it that's going to happen on April the 14th, yeah. 2025. The only thing we say about that is it's wrong. But I think being able to give some indication um, further out of what's coming forward would, would be of use to industry. OK, uh, that's fine. Thanks so much. Did, you didn't want to come in on that one, Mr Dixon? Yeah, sure. yeah um, I think the... Uh, the notion of having a forward pipeline of work is is, is crucial. So we, we are not obviously um, included, I think, in the specific uh, documentation you're talking about. But we do work within a, a regulatory cycle that allows us to have a, a long-term, medium-term and short-term view of the work that is coming. And uh, we endeavour to share that as widely as we can with all of our supply chain to allow um, sufficient planning to be done, A, to get the, the projects delivered efficiently and effectively, but B, to understand what capacity and capability we may need in the medium to longer term future. So, so, so how uh, certain can you be, how far ahead can you be certain as to what Scottish Waters investments well, will be? We have, uh, we, we are in the, the moment, we're in year four of a six year plan. So we've got reasonable certainty looking out to 2021. And as we go back into the regulatory cycle, we'll be looking to have about two years' worth of work for the next regulatory cycle understood by the back end of this year and then uh, into a kind of rolling two-year uh, plan thereafter. So I think we, we can see, um, if, you, if I was to build on, on uh, Graham's point, I think we can see with reasonably, reasonable accuracy out to 2021, but we can also uh, understand the nature of the project work that is coming up in the next period and some of the capacity and capability that we, we, we need support with from the industry, and that allows us to, to talk extensively to our supply chain about what needs to be... Um, uh, invested to grow, you know that capacity and capability. So I think the 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 whole notion of having a, a forward-looking pipeline with as much accuracy as you can is is very useful. Okay, thanks. I, I could ask more questions, but I think that's enough. Right, thank you, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, convener. <clears throat> uh, can I just first of all follow up a question for David Stewart? Um, do you, housing is infrastructure. Yes. We, we would certainly argue that it is, yes. Public and private housing is yes. infrastructure. Okay, yeah. just you said something that suggested yeah. it might not have been. I yeah. must, must have misunderstood <laughs> that. Um, these infrastructure investment plans, I mean, what more could be done to make them useful beyond what you've already hinted at in terms of giving greater certainty or giving greater forecasting further out? Um, in my view, and I appreciate it's difficult to do this, while I said that for the current parliament, um, there's a great deal of clarity around um, funding. There's three billion, over three billion public money so, to support affordable housing. And that'll be much funded by investment by landlords. Um, housing sometimes suffered a bit from changes over electoral cycles where there maybe isn't the long-term agreement on how much affordable housing or housing generally we need and how we could deliver it. So I appreciate the point about there being not a lot of point in having a 20-year plan for the A9 because it will change. But to some extent, if there could be consensus on broadly 
how we arrive at what housing need is and then how we're going to deliver it through planning and infrastructure and land release, then that would help, for example, if the housing industry is going to invest in apprentices and going to move to deli delivery through off-site and digital so that it attracts um, different groups of people into housing, more young people, more women. So I think anything that could, uh, I suppose, horizon scan and look to have a, a longer term target, even accepting that things will change because of economics or because of political cycles, I, I think that would be very helpful. Um, in its broadest sense, I think, I mean, you, many witnesses have probably said there's building construction, civil engineering, and house building. And then there's geographies in which people operate, and there's scales of projects that different organisations can get involved with and how they, how they work. So any information that we are able to provide or government's able to provide and others that, e even looking further out, breaks things down into those broad categories that different firms will be interested in construction, civils, house building, sort of scale of projects and whereabouts these things are going to happen is, in my mind, interesting. So you, you can create a sort of perfect world in your mind where you can look at areas of the country and scales of projects and, and, and the, the, the nature of, of activity that will be going on uh, and then work back to what is possible and, and what organisation owns which bits of data um, beyond that. I think Graham Dodds and then Soren Jensen wanted to come in. Thank you, Kavina. I, I would largely echo uh, what you <coughs> said there. I think um, understanding whether things are programmes or projects within programmes is useful, um, and, and particularly for SMEs to understand how will they engage with, um, for example, Tier 1 contractors in, in terms of programmes, so that there's a there's a forward idea of what they, they need to do and how they need to get engaged and whether there's there's elements within programmes that will be split out into projects that they could take on um, as an entity themselves. Uh, I think uh, the ability to, to give some classification, so I think it, the, the Australia-New Zealand system has this six, six classifications running from um, perspective through to, to closed out um, and I think that's useful um, in terms of an understanding about what the overall picture is. Again, it's not um, it's not focusing just on stuff that's got all of its permissions and is shovel ready, to use a phrase, um, but it's giving an indication to the industry of the types of schemes perhaps that are, are coming forward and therefore what kind of skills uh, the industry need to think about having mobilised at that particular time to meet that particular need. Yeah, I think that the question is if, if there's a possibility to, to move from something that is an infrastructure investment plan to something that is a broader overarching strategy. And this is, this is actually not, uh, that, not our thinking, but something that was recommended by Audit Scotland already in 2011, uh, that the infrastructure investment plan should be up, upgraded to this kind of overarching strategy uh, to identify some of these long-term uh, needs and, and constraints for capital investment in, in Scotland. So it was found at that time, uh, and I quote here, that the IP did not strategically as, uh, assess the complex interrelationship between needs, affordability, political priorities, and implementation capacity. Um, it's quite encouraging. This is after we concluded our research here, but we've noticed that, that recently the Scottish Government has created uh, the Infrastructure Commission uh, for Scotland that, that will uh, support the development of the next infrastructure investment plan. Um, I think our advice here would be that uh, go back to that recommendation from Audit Scotland um, and, and uh, instruct the Commission to, 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 and also to add value to the work of the Infrastructure Investment Board to, to work on something that is more uh, strategic, more visionary for the country to guide uh, um, priorities and, and decision making. I think the government's consulting or just maybe on, on the Infrastructure Commission right now. Ha have you, are you all responding? Sorry, I can help with the times. 
timescales for that. Yep. And, and the, the, the Infrastructure Commission, I just wrote down the, the, the remit before I came, so has been asked to provide independent, informed advice on the vision, ambition, and priorities for a long-term 30-year strategy for infrastructure in Scotland to meet our future economic growth and societal needs. And I understand they are, um, they are the Commission is, is out for um, views at the minute for contributions, and in case anyone's interested, it closes on the, the, the 3rd of May. I clicked on the website. <laughs> okay, I think someone else will be covering the Infrastructure Commission, Sorry. but I just want to talk about the government's plans for 1.5 billion per year investment by 2526. Um, is that realistic, and what should we be prioritising? Graham Dodds. Thank you, convener. I think the issue of realism is probably one that um, is probably a matter for, for, for government. I think from, from an industry perspective, we will respond to whatever um, is required. Um, industry will will ramp up as necessary to, to meet that, that, that need. I think the two points that I would make is, one would be that we don't um, see that increase and indeed our, our infrastructure spend at the moment as being first priority is to go to concrete and steel um, and and blacked up in terms of roads. I think there's a need for us to, to step back and look at um, emerging solutions. We're at the cusp of fourth industrial revolution, digital solutions. We need to think better about how we address infrastructure. Um, and when we do go to do concrete and steel, which we will do still, we need to make sure that we've chosen the best um, schemes to go forward that are cross-cutting and deliver for not just single parts of the economy, but deliver across the board. Um, I think the second point I would make around um, how that investment is prioritised. So at the moment, we have the Treasury rule book. Um, we look at 60-year return periods on investment. Um, and if anybody, I, I'm certainly not going to sit in front of you and tell you what the, I think the transport network is going to look in, like in 60 years. Um, we have the, the legacy of uh, not far from here, a bridge that's been there for almost 120 years that's still provide, providing and performing uh, an important role in getting trains across the fourth. So I, I think the way in which we examine and test infrastructure um, has to take on a lot more dimensions than simply economic rate of return. Um, and that needs to reflect what we want infrastructure to do. We don't build infrastructure for infrastructure's sake. We build it to allow our economy and our country to flourish. Sorry, if I could just follow up on that. I mean, would one of those things we need to differently think about low carbon, for example? Absolutely. So I would, I would say um, low carbon. I would say, you know, I think infrastructure sits there as a, a means of tackling a number of issues that we have. So how is it tackling health? How is it tackling social, uh, uh, social inequality? How is it tackling carbon and sustainability? And you can add to those. Okay. Anyone else got thoughts on the government's planned 1.5 billion per year? If not, I'll move on. Okay. Um, we're going to be looking at finance, I think, in the next uh, panel, but I was just wondering for the... Scottish Futures Trust, finance comes up and we see, there seems to be alchemy around this about how you fund particularly public infrastructure. Can you give us a flavour about where the Scottish Future Trust is going with the question of financing infrastructure? Well, the, um, the ambition to increase investment by a billion and a half pounds a year by the time we get to 2025-26 will not be deliverable from within capital budgets as they're currently um, set. So there will need to be, in my view, an element of financing to deliver that amount of increase in infrastructure investment. I think that should be a combination of public financing where that's possible, and it may include private financing if, there, if we still need increased um, activity um, to get to the infrastructure investment levels that we need. And um, we were asked last year to look at possible profit-sharing approaches to um, financing of future infrastructure investment, and we're doing that just at the minute. And members of the panel, members of the committee might know that um, the Welsh government is using an, an arrangement called the mutual investment model, which is similar to the MPD model that we used in Scotland in the past, 
um, but has a profit sharing approach rather than a profit capping approach that we had in, in MPD. So it's a, it's a very similar overall arrangement but involves up to the, the public sector taking around a 20% stake in, in the, the projects and investing in the projects up to around 20%. So we're looking at options like that should they need to be used to deliver the, the, the national infrastructure mission. What kind of projects are those? Is, is that kind of model anticipated for? Um, I would say that's in the too early to say bucket at the okay. minute because if we if we can use um, public forms of financing, then we would go to those first. Um, so it depends on the nature of investment projects that come forward in a future infrastructure investment plan and what would be suitable for that sort of investment. I'm just thinking a lot of in infrastructure now, private housing, broadband, some ut utilities. Is, it, is privately financed now. Yep. Um, I mean, is there a suggestion that that increased stake for the public sector should apply to private housing and digital and energy infrastructure? Oh, sorry, I was talking about projects that are ultimately paid for or funded by government budgets. Okay. When, when, this, when it's private infrastructure, then the, the private sector will have to finance its own infrastructure in the way that it, it needs to. to but is there any people. merit in thinking about giving the public sector more of a role? I mean, that's just as important to have electricity grids and digital grids and private housing. Um, we haven't considered um, public financing interventions in private infrastructure markets. Okay. Thanks very much. So, and Jensen, you wanted to come in. Yeah, so, so I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And there's, a, there's also an international uh, dimension <coughs> to this uh, discussion about attracting private uh, finance to, to public infrastructure at the moment. Um, and there are many reasons for and against that. I think generally uh, it's important, even more important, that there is increased transparency on some of these PPP type uh, arrangements because they include a different uh, type of risks uh, that also uh, quite often tends to fall uh, more on government, even if it's actually uh, uh, private finance uh, that's involved a bit in line with, with what uh, Peter was saying. There's another view, and it doesn't really, it doesn't contradict uh, the, this idea of attracting private finance to, to public investment, uh, but that is to look at how can you obtain better value from the money that is, is already invested or that's already available uh, looking at uh, closing some of the efficiency gaps I think the the IMF has estimated that uh, actually in all types of countries there are efficiency gaps in that range between 10 to 30 percent of from in public investments and I think they actually well they quantify this for uh, advanced economies to 13 uh, percent of course each different country will fall have a different specific uh, amount of, uh, of losses in, from efficiency gaps in public investment. Uh, and I think there's an, there's an increasing, a growing consensus about one of the way to, to, to mitigate this or address or close this efficiency gap um, is to, to, to improve infrastructure governance. Um, and try to avoid some of the, the, the pitfalls that are, are all too well known um, in relation to, to public infrastructure that runs over time, uh, over budget, and doesn't deliver on the, the expected goals. Um, this is why we promote, promote uh, more transparency and more accountability in infrastructure investments, generally. You're sitting in one of those projects. Pardon? You're sitting in one of these projects. <laughs> I, I am uh, well aware of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, thank you. Um, just to follow up, um, Soren Jensen, on the, the question of the Infrastructure Investment Board, do you think that private sector contractors should be included on that? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Uh, um, thank you for, for, for clarifying uh, on, on this issue. Um, so we generally uh, recommend more structured and systematic uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, including the possibility of discussing policy options uh, in infrastructure governance. Um, and multi-stakeholder working is one of our core features. Um, and it, that consists, I, I just need to explain that a little bit, how that consists in, in, in bringing together government, industry and civil society in, a, in an effort to pursue uh, the goal of improving transparency and accountability in public infrastructure. 
in our member countries, that is usually done by forming what's called a multi-stakeholder working group that oversees the implementation of the program. Now, when we started looking at, uh, and this was in the, the context in which the, uh, the Scotland case study was developed, started looking at how our core features uh, could be adapted to high income country or advanced economy context. This usual model uh, of ours didn't appear as the most constructive uh, way forward. Um, so we were very keen to look at existing institutional uh, setups that could adopt uh, features such as uh, multi-stakeholder working. Um, and what we was really interesting in Scotland was that we found that there is a, a, a quite advanced level of strategic planning and also an institutional uh, setup to oversee its uh, implementation. Uh, and what we believe is that these institutions can increase their legitimacy and credibility by being constituted in a manner uh, that is representative for different sectors of society. So we're not suggesting that contractors as such should be on the infrastructure uh, investment board, but rather that representative bodies uh, and associations should have uh, a possibility. All right, but, but you say it increased the legitimacy of these, but do, will it increase their effectiveness? Uh, well, we, it, we believe there, that. There, there is a difference yeah. you appreciate it, between people saying this is a great idea yes. and it actually working. And if something is just going to, yeah. you know, make people buy into it mm. at a high level, so to speak, but not, it doesn't actually accomplish anything, namely what you set out when you started to answer my question as the goal. It's, it, um, I mean, that's, that's really the question, isn't it? it it's, it's very true. And I know there's a history uh, of, of trying to improve the efficiency of this uh, body uh, here in Scotland. In our experience, it what multi-stakeholder working does is that it helps building trust and uh, enable uh, different sectors to understand each other's point of view uh, at, an, at an earlier stage. We have uh, a minister in one country that has said that basically because we have the multi-stakeholder uh, working group, um, there are things that we can discuss between us that otherwise would end up on the front page of the newspapers next day. So the question is, do you, can, you, can you find efficiency gains <laughs> in, the, in the beginning of... Yes, by, but, by, but by I, mean, I mean, surely, um, I mean, again, my question is not about what ends up on the front page of the newspaper the next day, but whether or not the thing works. And that's really the, the point, and transparency also is obviously that there has to be accountability and public accountability. So it's not about um, brushing things away or discussing them privately without anything working out, surely. Mm. Do you agree with that? Uh, I'd agree with that. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> now, there are other committee members who want to ask questions. Other panel members want to come in. So I wonder um, if I could just... De Dean Lockhart had a, a follow-up question, I think, and... It, thank, uh, thank you, Peter. Hear that. It, it was just a very brief follow-up question on the sources of investment. As the panel will be aware, uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank is, is uh, legislation is being introduced to um, establish the bank, and one of its main missions is infrastructure development. Uh, I wonder if the panel members could uh, explain briefly the role of the investment bank in terms of infra infrastructure development and what discussions you've had with the Scottish Government in terms of how it will impact the current work of your organisation. And Mr Riki, I guess maybe start with you because the Scottish Futures Trust obviously will uh, have a very close working relationship presumably with the new bank. Uh, I think Peter Riki wanted my point, so perhaps uh, a dual answer. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, on the, uh, the SNIB <coughs> point, I, I was involved in some of the early work in the SNIB, but I've not been involved in that for, for some time now. The, um, it, it is a source of public funding and therefore it can provide its finance to um, projects that are ultimately in, in the private sector but where there is a policy interest in those being taken forward. So we might think about renewable energy projects that will ultimately um, be, be part of the energy system. We might think about increasing the energy efficiency of buildings that's ultimately paid for by the occupiers. 
But because of that structure where it provides a, a source of public finance, it won't be able to fund things like schools and hospitals and, and roads because of the rules around balance sheet treatment. That would just be seen as, as public capital funding and wouldn't deliver any additionality. So I think it does have a role to play in, in, in um, the infrastructure sector on possibly new areas, possibly low carbon areas, and that rather depends on the missions that it's, uh, it's set over, over the period um, before it gets set up, but we will certainly be keeping close to that and working closely with it. Thank you. Should I come back to the IIB briefly? Uh, if you want to very briefly, perhaps. I just thought I should probably say that I'm a member of the IIB um, Infrastructure Investment Board, and it functions as a as, as an internal governance system that sits over projects and programmes. I'm really pleased that um, the government set up the Infrastructure Commission for Scotland to look at longer term plans for infrastructure and has on that a set of, of stakeholders from across industry and academia and, and other interested bodies. So for me, it's particularly important that all of those stakeholders are involved in, in looking to the future and helping us set um, good priorities for Scotland. All right, thank you. Um, David Stewart. Um, and just to answer the question on, on what the bank might fund, um, I think there's a couple of major challenges in, in housing. One is while land might be available, it's often difficult to fund infrastructure necessary to develop sites. So if the bank could actually help with that and strategically enable the development of large sites by putting infrastructure in up front, that would be extremely helpful and I think a more effective way to fund development. The second one's going back to Peter's point. Um, there's a great need to increase the energy efficiency of existing housing to address fuel poverty and meet climate change targets. There's a need to switch to low carbon energy and particularly low carbon heating. So if the bank could could help to fund that for all tenures of housing, I, I, th I think that would be extremely helpful. All right, thank you. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Over the course of this inquiry, the committee's heard very varied views on whether the actual construction sector has the capacity to deliver uh, the country's infrastructure needs. What are your views on whether the appropriate skills and the capacity within the industry actually exists? Mark Dixon. I think the uh, um, something that's critical to the the future is being mindful of the capacity and capability that is required and working with the sector to make sure that these skills are are introduced. Um, so our, our um, experience is uh, that the the industry will grow to deliver what we need it to be delivered, but equally our experience is that we have to work very closely with them to facilitate that uh, by um, promoting the intake of graduates, apprentices, attracting different types of people uh, into the industry so uh, and, and working with them to understand the different mix of work that's coming in the future. So we've heard, heard earlier on about um, the impact of digital, the need to focus on low carbon. Uh, one of the challenges that we face is that we will be moving more and more to investment to maintain our existing uh, asset stock. So it will be a lot more about mechanical and electrical type of work uh, as well as civils work. So I think uh, it's a key question you ask uh, and I would just probably summarise it by saying uh, we think that the, the capacity and capability uh, exists but we recognise that it has to grow and that we need to work closely with all of our suppliers and tend to work with them on a, a long term basis if we can to facilitate that. Taking it from that and Sorry, I'll come back to you in a second. Taking it from that, do you consider that, given the current pipeline, that the capacity is there to deliver what's in the pipeline? Um, well, well, from my uh, from my perspective, um, as we look forward over the next ten years or so, we're going to have to grow uh, capability and capacity for certain types of work. Uh, 
uh, we, we're not uh, sensing at the moment from talking to all of the, the, the people that we work with in the industry that that cannot be done. But we need to we need to grow into certain types of work over two, three, four years. So it, it's linked into the it's linked into the forward planning of the, of of the pipeline. So I think the capacity and capability can be there if you if you move gradually into the new types of work that are coming down the the, the pipeline. The core skill sets are certainly there. So I did assume you were coming in yeah, there. Um, just to say. Um, from our understanding, there is a challenge um, with capacity. There's an ageing workforce, certainly in house and construction. It's obvious, often quite reliant on EU migrants, so there's a potential challenge coming there. Um, we've entered a partnership with the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre to promote um, the potential of off-site construction and the use of digital technology and that's partly to increase capacity and partly to increase the, the quality of buildings produced. But I think it's also with understanding that we need to attract new entrants into the industry and, and different entrants. I think at the moment the profile is very much of an ageing workforce and a largely male workforce. So I think there needs to be a real effort to to modernise it and to make it a, a more attractive career for a wider range of people. Am I correct in taking what you're saying that at the moment the capacity isn't actually there to deliver what's in the pipeline, but it's hoped that it will be? I would say more um, the capacity might be just about there, but we've got anecdotal feedback that as our members are working to increase the delivery of affordable housing, and there's been quite a step change from a 30,000 unit target in the last parliament to 50,000 in this parliament. We're already hearing that in certain uh, trades, such as bricklaying, there's um, a difficulty in uh, attracting enough workers, and there's a, a premium in certain trades. So I think it's something certainly in the medium to long term, that there needs to be action taken to, to remedy. But is that any different from what it was before? I mean, historically, there's always periodic uh, shortages in certain trades and it corrects itself and so forth. Are we not just in the same situation at the moment? I think the difference here might be around um, the fact that the workforce is ageing. So it's not just to think there's a shortage now, but what happens when, when many people retire? But what was the, I mean, it, historically also, we, you know, I can remember years back people talking about the ageing workforce, but it always seems to adjust itself as time goes on. I mean, it, it, in the natural course of time, people retire and a fairly high percentage at any time will be, you know, over 50, let's say. I, I would think that might be different. I, I don't know about the period you're referring to, but... If you have a workforce where the profile is very much top heavy, then I think there's a need to make sure there are new entrants and apprentices coming in and that the the work the industry is seen as attractive to, to these so people. So simple question, are there enough apprentices coming in at the moment? I think there's a, a challenge around around that. But I mean we hear this word challenge a lot, what does that mean? Yes or no answer. <laughs> are there enough apprentices yeah, yeah, I, coming in or not? Uh, no, I, I think there arguably aren't, and there's certainly there it needs to be something that's attra more attractive to women, for example. Um, Graham Dodds wanted to come in, and then Mark yeah. Dixon. Yeah. Thank, thank you, convener. Um, <coughs> I, th I think a few brief points. First of all, remember that industry is largely reacting to client needs and it's what we're good at doing so when client requirements need us to ramp up um, we do that we've done that for a long long time and I, I think it's something we will continue to do because we're, we're market driven perhaps a couple of lenses looking at the the, the issue of of, uh, of capacity if you if you look on the national and international capacity perspective we know that Ireland is um, very hot 
at the moment in infrastructure terms. So there's a great deal of uh, going on there. There's a great deal of demand for skills. We know that we have major projects um, like HS2 um, and, and the such like where those will soak up um, capacity. So, so we can't see Scotland in, a, in isolation from in a capacity sense. These things have, have impacts on, on skills and, and people. Um, what I would say is that the tier one projects in Scotland, tier one projects will always get the high level of skill that they require just because of, of their profile and what they are. I think the danger when we have any pool on, on skills and resources is that it's the tier two projects that will tend to suffer as a result of that. Um, so so, so the, that, that, that kind of global and, and, and um, national lens, I think there's a local lens as well, which is that when we're constructing or designing in particular parts of Scotland, we can max out the supply chain base pretty quickly in some areas. Um, and so I think having that wide supply chain base across Scotland is actually really important for, for um, both consultants and contractors in, in being able to bring that forward. I think we also, we also need to see that the infrastructure of tomorrow is not going to need exactly the same skills base that we have of the infrastructure of yesterday and today. So, for example, we have we've developed a whole new division around digital solutions, which is a significant investment. Um, but we see that as a major uh, area of growth. And I think the final point would be that that f for 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 us, um, Scotland's one of our global design centres. So, we have a, a major amount of skills and resource here. And actually, one of the things that we do in balancing off the demand that we have in Scotland locally is that we have those teams operating on an international um, uh, front. So just as an example, my, my real signalling grouping, we're working on Australian stuff the other month there. Um, but that's people sitting in Scotland working on international projects. Yeah, I just wanted to bring this uh, issue to, to, to life and link it back to um, planning. I mean, the, the, the issues that uh, colleagues are talking about, about bringing in apprentices and graduates, I think is, is a live issue for us all. And, you know, we, we, we are working hard to bring in lots of new people. But to, to link it back to planning, we, we know, for example, that over the next five years, uh, five to ten years, we'll probably need to double the level of investment that we make in maintaining our existing assets. Um, and to do that, we'll probably need to double the amount of work we do on mechanical and electrical installations. Um, so we're working with our supply chain to build that capacity. And the key to this is about planning, because you can't switch it on overnight. But if you, if you plan forward, you can build the capacity, particularly if you've got some uh, good long relationships with the supply chain. So I think the key to this is understanding what's coming and ramping up to have the capacity. So clearly, if we if we doubled the investment in a certain type of um, a work tomorrow, we wouldn't have the capacity. But if we know it's coming two or three years down the line, we can work with the supply chain and ramp up to get that capacity. Uh, uh, and I think uh, rec we would recognise it's not just about capacity, it's about capability as well. So I think it, 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 it's a it's a live issue, but we've got to tie it back to how we plan for the plan for what's coming down the line. Actually, you raise a very good point there that perhaps we haven't put a lot of emphasis on uh, about maintaining the infrastructure that's actually been built because that will take resources away from the new infrastructure, presumably. We, we, I'm not sure how well that's been factored in. Well, we certainly have we we've certainly put a lot of time and attention into that because we see. Uh, more and more investment in the future being on maintaining the existing assets. Ergo, the nature and type of projects will be different. Ergo, we've got to grow skills uh, in that space as well as the, the, new, the, the new build space. And I think that's going to be true all, all, over all types of uh, infrastructure. Uh, and as you maintain that, you know, I would link it back to the, the point that, uh, that Graham made, you know, you've got to grow additional skills, digital skills, as well as uh, traditional uh, civil skills. So certainly it's something we're alive to and putting a, a, putting a lot of time and effort into right at the minute. I'm certainly very clear that 
Um, investment in infrastructure equals investment in new infrastructure and investment in maintaining the infrastructure we've got already. It's all part of the same overall thing to me. And at, at risk of oversimplifying this, um, then I, I think if, we, if we're going to increase our investment levels by a billion and a half pounds a year by the time we get to six, seven years' time, we don't have that much spare capacity sitting on pegs in the industry at the minute. So there will need to be investment by the industry in its people and its productivity. So probably more people and probably more output per person, which is productivity. So the digital arena and, and manufacturing, whether that be off-site or on-site. And as a public sector, in my view, our responsibility to help industry invest in its people and its productivity is to make sure they've got visibility of the pipeline and they've got the procurement approaches that allow them to invest. So I see that setting of the long-term ambition as the right thing to do, but there's work for the industry to do and there's work for the public sector to do to allow the industry to do that over the next five or six years to get there. Thank you, Jackie Bailey. Um, I wonder, before I proceed on to my question, which is about procurement, could I return to Scottish Water for a minute just to um, probe something of what you said? Um, if there's clearly going to plan quite an increased amount of capital spend um, to protect your existing um, infrastructure. What order of magnitude is that compared to your current expenditure? Because um, I'm interested in who pays for it and is there an increase in people's water bills as a consequence? Yes, uh, well, the, ultimately, uh, the investment undertaken by Scottish Water is uh, funded through customer charges and supplemented by uh, borrowing, so I didn't enter the question earlier on uh, about the, uh, the, the bank. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the needs coming down the, the, the line, um, we, we probably see uh, the need to increase investment o on maintenance. We're going through the planning cycles just now, but we'll probably see um, at, at, at the moment, um, about 50-50 um, is, is between new infrastructure and maintaining uh, existing infrastructure. Uh, in terms of needs, we're probably moving more towards sort of 70, 70, 30. Please don't take these as gospel because it's just going through the planning cycle at the moment. But in the order of probably 70, 70 30, 70 towards uh, maintaining existing asset stock and 30 towards um, a new asset stock. In terms of what that will mean th in, in total levels of investment, that's still getting uh, worked on and it's getting worked on through a kind of a uh, multi-stakeholder group. Uh, and in terms of, of, therefore, how that will be paid for, I, I can't really comment on, on at the moment. All I can really say is that that, that we we have uh, most of our most of our pipelines. Okay, most of our infrastructure was uh, built post-war, and many of our uh, non-infrastructure components, water treatment works and wastewater treatment works, were built in the kind of uh, early 80s. So when you've got water treatment works or wastewater treatment works that are getting to 25, 30 years old, a lot of the component elements uh, are starting to get to end of life. And when we've got pipelines that are built post-war, a lot of them are starting to come to end of life. So therefore, we'll have to refurbish and yeah. maintain all If it all helps, I'm, I'm making no criticism of ensuring that our existing infrastructure is maintained. I'm interested in knowing how we pay for it. Yeah. Because if there's going to be a substantial increase in spending, um, then you know there used to be a principle that water infrastructure investment was taken over generations. Um, mm. The repayment of it certainly was taken over generations because it impacted on more than just the existing generation. I'm not clear if that principle still exists or whether the current bill payers are going to pay the cost of all this infrastructure investment. Well, uh, it's pr I'm, I'm, I'm probably not best equipped to answer that okay. question uh, just now, but ultimately, ultimately in our sector, uh, as, uh, as the customers, therefore, the, uh, who, who pay, yeah. whether that's through charges in the short term or through repayment of borrowing in the long term. You, you spoke about external capacity of contractors and you're naturally working with your supply chain. What about internal capacity? Isn't it the case that Scottish Water actually use a lot of agency workers to supplement your own staff? Is, is that true? We, um, 
we do use agency workers. We 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 tend to we tend to use agency workers, uh, but we're pre predominantly most of our own staff are Scottish Water employees. We do use agency workers to to deal with um, peaks and troughs, and particularly if if we're if we're needing a certain skill set for a period of time, where that period of time not be, may not be sufficient to. Um, to bring what, on people. what percentage of the overall Scottish Water staff are agency workers? Uh, oh, I, I, I can, I can, I can tell you. It's been suggested to me it might be about twenty percent. Uh, figure you I'd would recognise. I'd need to check. In my own, in my own part of the business, okay, in the capital investment sure. part of the business, it, it, it flexes between fifteen to twenty percent, uh, usually to bring in skills for particular work types. In terms of the company as a whole. I don't have that information to hand, but I can certainly supply that, uh, that would be very post, the, post the meeting. That's great. Thank you. Convener, can I move on to um, the question I was supposed to ask um, on procurement? Um, the committee's obviously received evidence um, to suggest that procurement hurdles act as a disincentive to firms actually bidding for public sector contracts. Um, do you think current procurement arrangements act as a barrier for firms? And if you do, um, can you tell me what improvements you would make to make it easier for firms, particularly small and local firms, um, to tender to access supply chain opportunities. Maybe Peter Riki might want to start. I can happily start, yeah. Well, the first thing to say, it would be entirely wrong for me to disagree with that statement given the evidence you've received um, so far during this inquiry. Um, but I think it's also true to say that public procurement is very difficult to do well and as compared to procurement of, of works in, and construction works in the in the private sector then we in the public sector are required to to work with a significant volume of regulation and guidance to, to make sure everything's fair play and transparent that's not wrong that's right but it does add to the complexity of what we have to do we also have to deliver on a lot of agendas aside with aside from building the new asset we have to um, work on community engagement, on training opportunities, and um, on working with SMEs. None of that's wrong. It's entirely right. But it gives procurers a lot of things to do, as well as focusing on what asset they're going to buy during that procurement stage. We've also got, as you slightly allude to, competing priorities, which I think you've probably heard evidence on already, which is that elements of the industry that we deal with that supply to us would like to would say to us that if we bring demand together and create um, framework opportunities and long-term opportunities for them, then they will be able to invest in productivity and invest in their people that will allow them to deliver better for us. And we have another subset of people that we work with that say that it would be better if we procured everything individually and on a local level so that smaller firms can have access at the top level of supply chains rather than um, in the in the supply chains delivering projects so I think that there what we have to try and do is make sure the right sorts of projects are able to um, appeal to the right sorts of contractors so there's a good fit between those operations and we can't go all one way and we can't go all of the other way um, and the the skills base in public procurement I think can always do with more investment so wherever we can help people in SFT as a sort of central body we do that but most of the procurement activity is done in for social infrastructure probably in health boards and local authorities and it is a a, a very challenging thing for people to do well and they, everyone is doing the best we can but there's always more we can do on um, suiting both of those two things which I think are needed we do need to give some areas more long term opportunities that allow people to invest and we do need to keep some things um, small and, and local to allow SME contractors to get in at the tier one stage delivering and then to hopefully grow to become the next generation of larger contractors after that I'm far from saying we've got everything right in that my organisation is, is trying to do better We've just restructured um, so that one of my directors is looking um, explicitly at this area of the interaction between the public sector and, and industry to try and to try and help improve that over time. Okay. Mr Stewart. 
and then yeah, Mr. Um, Don. I, I would, would largely I, I agree with what Peter just said. Um, I can't disagree that um, public procurement rules can be complex and, and can therefore be challenging or, or could potentially put off um, SMEs from bidding. And equally, we find in our sector where the public procurement rules apply, it can be a challenge for housing associations. The, the average housing association in <coughs> Scotland has less than 1,000 units, so they don't have the same capacity in terms of procurement teams or expertise as perhaps an NHS trust or, or Police Scotland would have. But on the other hand, I, I think the procurement rules are in place for good reason. Um, it, it's public money that's being spent. It's right that uh, then community benefits are sought, um, value for money is sought, that um, practices around fair work are, are encouraged. So um, I can't provide a, a magic solution, but I can maybe say a little bit about um, what we've done as a sector and other practices I'm aware of to try and help engage SMEs. Um, we've um, provided training to our members to in increase capacity, and part of that is not just helping them understand how to follow the procurement rules and, and comply, but also how to engage with SMEs, how to help them understand what um, housing associations are looking for, and also to deliver better community benefits from spend. Um, we've also worked with the Supplier Development Programme, which um, has a, as its mission really to engage with suppliers and particularly small and medium-sized enterprises to allow them what they have to do to be able to comply and succeed in bids. And a final thing I could say is that um, it's often possible for contracts to break them up into smaller lots so that not only very large um, contractors or multinationals can bid, but there is scope for local uh, companies to, to bid and to bring their local expertise and also then provide local employment. I should say yeah. that um, if you want to add further comments in writing following today's session, then um, please feel free to do so, including on points that we've already covered where you've indicated you want to do so. Um, we do have limited time, however, so I'll ask Graham Dodds to comment and then perhaps come to Jamie Halcor johnson for further questions. Thank you, convener. I, I think um, a, few, a, a few brief points. One point around procurement at the start of, of projects and, and assigning what projects should be is that quite often when we look at something that comes out, we think, well, if you'd asked that question slightly differently, you would probably end up with a slightly different answer or a, a better framed infrastructure solution at the end of the day. So the scenarios where we've had prior engagement, industry days and such like, in the lead in to these, I think have been very valuable in providing conversation and feedback to agencies that have allowed them to frame the, the question that they want um, support to, to answer. Um, I think, I know that the committee's taken evidence around innovation and how um, procurement can drive or not um, innovation. And I think one of the, the issues we have at the moment is that industry largely reflects the procurement process that it stands um, alongside. So if we want innovation, then the procurement process needs to drive that rather than drive um, cost potentially as, as, as biggest elements. Um, I know you'll take evidence and evidence the next session from contractors, so I, I won't, I won't um, comment on, on, on that further. I think in terms of improvements, I know that um, Public Contracts Scotland um, is working to improve things. And I think one of the areas where is very valuable is where we have uh, information that doesn't change except on an annual basis. So that's stuff like accounts, all the um, the hygiene stuff that goes with, uh, with bidding. And actually the ability to upload that and have a one hit of that during a year is very valuable. I think particularly for SMEs, 
it, to some extent, it's fine for companies like mine because we have dedicated teams that operate on that side of things. But but making that uh, a, a more effective process for SMEs, I think, would be useful. Thank you, Jamie Hulker Johnson. Thank you very much, Kavina. Um, uh, in my area of the Highlands Islands, obviously there's a number of companies of different size, but there's a lot of smaller companies, um, their local firms there working as well, and they have had some involvement with some of the larger projects that have been going on within the area. Um, but one of the views, or some of the views that have been expressed to this committee have been that um, frameworks can be very positive, or a positive way uh, of managing procurement. So I just wondered what, um, uh, how those impact on those local companies and the ability or the access of local companies to, um, to some of these larger contracts. Mark Dixon. Yeah, quite happy to, to uh, give you a perspective on that. We, we have, um, as well as frameworks, we've got uh, a series of uh, rural contractors. Um, so we, we have some larger alliances, some tier one contractors and about 50 odd uh, rural contractors. Uh, and quite a number of these up in the, the islands and islands. And we, we endeavour to support them through procurement exercises where, where the procurement exercises can be complex, so we offer to support them. Uh, and we, we run um, three times a year what we call rural roadshows, where we go around and meet all the rural contractors and try to do what we can to connect them with the, the larger organisations that are on, on frameworks, where there may be opportunities for them also connect them to our organisation and assist them where there may be uh, direct um, procurement oppor opportunities. Uh, so I think the, 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 uh, the key to this is that actually a lot of the stuff that we deliver in the rural areas, we need the support of the, um, the local organisations and many of our frameworks and larger contractors need the support of the local organisations. So I think the key, the key to that is just to recognise that uh, and make sure that all the connections are in place between all the all the relative uh, organisations, uh, and that that support actually would give not just, for example, on procurement, but on health and safety or training. So we try and take uh, those sort of things out to the out to the local organisations as much as much as we can. Yep. For me, on the housing side, it's really about. Um, frameworks being developed appropriately and with the, the range of geographies and the range of different projects uh, and Scotland being borne in mind. Um, there was one example of a, a framework that originated in England that actually had a housing framework with only one Scottish contractor, which obviously isn't, isn't ideal, but to maybe talk about some of the the players on the, the housing landscape. Um, I know we work quite closely with Scotland Excel and the majority of their business goes to SMEs. Um, the Scottish Procurement um, Alliance um, have sell, set up new build housing frameworks, but they've got different geographic areas to acknowledge that you'll need different contractors doing different scales of jobs from very rural to, to larger developments, say in Glasgow or Edinburgh. And finally, um, Hub West Scotland, which is a, a mix of public and private, um, have recently developed a housing offer, but they've essentially got two scales. They've got the fairly large um, developments, um, but they've also got um, an offer for smaller developments then allows small and medium-sized enterprises to be part of the framework. So I think it's about them being set up and, and used appropriately to respond to both the, the different needs of different clients, but also to, to allow small and medium enterprises to, to take part. Uh, Angela Constance, if you want. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, when you consider the uh, level of information available on public sector infrastructure and also the ability of the construction sector to engage in uh, infrastructure uh, projects in Scotland, how does Scotland compare 
to the rest of the UK and are there other lessons we should be learning from international experience? And I'll start with Mr Jensen. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so we actually have some uh, very recent uh, research uh, coming out from uh, looking at the UK level. And, and interestingly, it shows that um, uh, the level of transparency is uh, not only higher in Scotland, but significantly higher than it is at, uh, at UK level. Um, I think I mentioned, referred to the, to the numbers earlier of uh, for large and medium-sized projects being 95 and 70% of measured against the cost infrastructure data standard. Uh, in the UK, the equivalent is only 60% for large and 35% uh, for medium-sized um, enterprise. I don't have time to explain in detail what the infrastructure data standard actually mm -hmm. request is disclosed, but I'll be happy to, to submit that uh, okay. uh, subsequently. Also, just to say that, there is a possibility of strengthening this even further by going back to the initial uh, conversation about having, you know, avoiding that the data is fragmented and scattered in different uh, mm -hmm. sites, websites, and reports. And it's quite easy uh, to actually create a single online platform that just connects uh, the location of these different data points. And that could make Scotland a, a real leader international on infrastructure transparency. Okay, thank you. I wondered, Mr. Ricky, if you had anything to add about how Scotland compares to the rest of the UK, or indeed uh, further afield in terms of the level of infrastructure available, sorry, the level of information on infrastructure projects that are available, and indeed the ability of this, the construction sector to um, engage with infrastructure projects. Well, I mean, Soren looks more internationally than, than we do, but the... Um, we, we, on engagement, we're always trying to do more, but we have a pretty good, I think, network with um, the contractors and we're involved in a, a structured set of discussions on a, a regular basis now between government, SFT and the contracting community to understand what needs to change in the future. We um, engage on specific projects and programmes before, before the start of that before they kick off so that industry has a good sense of what's coming and on individual projects increasingly we're doing early contractor involvement to bring them into the development stage of projects so it's a I would say it's it's a pretty good level of, of understanding between the the private sector delivery organizations and the public sector um, it could always be better we, we we can always work more on that on the international point we're certainly keen to learn um, best practice from around the world. We spent time with the, the New Zealand infrastructure grouping came across here um, to learn what we were doing and we learned some, something of what they were doing. Um, I spoke at their infrastructure conference, five video conference I have to say. Um, and uh, and we've, we've done all sorts of different things internationally. We're a member of some of the European investment bank groupings to share experience across, across Europe and the OECD have some good infrastructure networks as well so I would say and across the UK we we obviously interact with our colleagues in in the other nations so um, always keen to do more but we have a fairly good working relationship with industry in Scotland I think helped by our by our scale and and we do learn internationally as well we have an outward looking approach okay thank you I'm conscious of time coming yes thank you very much so thank you to our panel as I say if there's anything you want to add to any of your answers please do feel free to write into the committee to uh, do so thank you for coming in today and I'll suspend the meeting for a changeover of witnesses to the next panel thank you
and to our panel. Um, I think first of all, Stephen Slesser is Operations Director, Infrastructure Scotland from Morrison Construction, and Shona Frame is a partner in CMS Cameron McKenna Nabarro Allswang LLP, and also Gavin Pay Payton, who is a partner in Burness Paul LLP. So welcome to all three of you today. Um, if I might start um, with um, a question on finance. Um, what are the panel's views on uh, whether or not financial institutions are properly engaged with the construction industry and construction companies? And I should say before we start that um, Len, um, Len Bunton was meant to be here but is unfortunately unable to attend uh, the panel session. So who would like to start off and give comment on whether or not the financial sector is uh, properly engaged with the construction industry. Stephen Slesser. Um, I think recently, since uh, the advent of Curlian's uh, recent demise, the business environment is really quite challenging for construction companies. Um, the traditional sort of view is that banks uh, have really supported the, the business, and while mainstream lenders are still engaged with the sector, um, th there's a, a definitely a trend away, and you can see that in terms of recently around Intersave and Kia, how they've been treated by markets. Average net debt's risen quite significantly, and um, that's really been born over the years where there's been a, a sort of significant um, period of time where um, cheap funding was available, cheap money, and, and some companies had used that to capitalise to, to fund growth. But in, in some instances, though, that, that's changing rather dramatically now, um, which is leading to some of the reasons why we find the market quite challenging, but also the way that construction is built upon it, it's quite cash intensive. Um, and, um, you know, liquidity is really important. And net, le net debt levels across industry uh, in 2016 were 10 and a half times the combined UK income of the top UK 10 contractors. Uh, and in 2009, that was six and a half times. So, you know, there's been a real move towards debt in that section. And in terms of SMEs, you know, on a smaller level, you know, they are struggling as well in terms of obtaining accessible and reasonable finance. Thank you. I mean, I don't know, Shona Frame and Gavin Payton, if you're involved in the acquisition of finance or the, the more the setting up of what is already agreed for clients, uh, whether either of you have any comments to make on how financial institutions are relating to the construction industry currently. Um, Gavin Payton. Yep, we'd be happy to comment briefly. Um, yeah, principally involved in, in setting up the arrangements um, rather than, um, or implementing the arrangements rather than negotiating them. But um, I think the, certainly the feedback that we get is that in terms of finance from the main lenders, a uh, combination of you know, low margins uh, in the construction sector, you know, high risk um, projects, and um, I suppose recent insolvencies particularly, um, it, it's certainly viewed with uh, caution uh, by lenders, because if you're talking high risk and, and low margins, then very soon you can end up in a situation where uh, difficulties arise, as we've seen in some, some recent high-profile cases. So um, that model, um, I think, uh, and recent high-profile cases has had an impact, I think. Mm. All right. Shona Frame, did you want to um, come in there? No, <clears throat> I don't have much to add on that. Mm. My, my expertise is around the, the other end of construction mm -hmm. projects. All right, fair enough. Um, I should also say, if you want to come in at any point, just indicate by raising your hand, um, and the sound desk will operate the mic, so no need to press any buttons. Um, we'll come now to Andy Whiteman. Can we just following that that up? Um, we did a, uh, an inquiry recently on uh, business gateway um, uh, support that's provided by local authorities to, to businesses. Um, in general terms, looking across business support, business gateway, Scottish Enterprise, etc., does the construction sector get the same level of business support, including financial support from public sector bodies, or is it treated somewhat differently? Um, construction companies, um, because of the, the thin margins we operate and the procurement models that are based upon, we effectively fund public sector contracts and, and uh, private sector contracts for the first 30 days. So in reality, we, we're getting paid on day 60. 
um, after we first start on site. Yet there's an expectation that we will um, that cash will flow immediately down to our supply chain from day 30 or day 31. On, on top of that, um, getting access to finance is can can be difficult, depending on some of the terms and conditions that certain local authorities or, or um, procuring bodies um, put in place, which can mean that in some instances, you know, we take decisions not to pursue certain projects because of that. And so, in terms of getting that level of support, most of this support is targeted at the SME sector within Scotland in terms of Scottish Enterprise and, and Business Gateway. So from a, from a tier one contract, from our perspective, it's not something we've had a great deal of um, visibility of. And if you, were, if, you were, if you were contemplating tendering to build a, a hospital, let's say, um, how would you fund that first 30 days then? You say it's your... It's funded from our own net cash reserves. So we use a, a mixture of uh, cash reserves, trade credit, bank borrowing, private equity finance to be able to, to do that. That's one of the uh, attractions of using a, a major contractor that they have a strong balance sheet and strong balance sheets are really important. Okay, um, very good. Um, are, is there any experience in the panel of alternative sources of finance in the construction industry? I mean, obviously we've had recent experience of PPP and P PFI, which, um, and there's attempts by the Scottish Futures Trust to, to generate new models of funding, but do panel members have any comments on um, different ways of funding Construction. Kevin Payton. Be, be happy to comment. I think um, my practice is, is focused on sort of mainstream construction development in the public and private sector, and also project finance. And certainly, um, in the twenty odd years that I've been in the profession, we we certainly seen the availability of um, project finance models uh, and the, the supply chain associated with them, or the, the pipeline, sorry, associated with them, being quite spiky. Um, and that um, does have a, an impact, I think, on, on the market. Um, we've got a, quite a strong um, core of, of expertise in project finance within Scotland, um, but, but it waxes and wanes uh, as, as the models are available at the moment. We've got the hub DBFM model, uh, which is delivering a lot of um, fantastic S Sorry, projects. which model? Uh, the hub uh, DBFM oh, yeah. model, which yeah. is a sort of project finance model within the hub um, framework. Um, and that's delivering some, some fantastic projects. Obviously, we've seen um, NPD has uh, projects have not been proceeding recently because of accounting treatment issues. But I think the market would certainly welcome um, uh, a further development of NPD, uh, a new project finance model to deliver the sort of big infrastructure projects. Okay, thank you. I just want to show in a frame. I, I think you deal with um, disputes, as it were, where things fall apart, so to speak. Is there a particular finance model that tends to, I mean, if we look at the, the question of um, what are the, the models that tend to seem to work as opposed to not work? Are you able to comment on that? Um, <coughs> the, the disputes that I deal with are focused around <coughs> time, money and defects. Like these are the constant themes that we see and that goes across all of the, the methods of procurement the different forms of standard forms and increasingly in recent years PFI, PPP models, um, these exact same issues are, are coming through <clears throat> and particularly in the PFI contracts at the moment we're seeing a, a very large increase in the number of disputes concerning deductions, performance uh, deduction uh, payment mechanisms. So you wouldn't single out any particular procurement model or finance model as better than another in that sense? I think what we're starting to see is a trend towards more partnering and alliancing forms of contract. Now, I've, I've had many disputes under those forms of contract, so I think the way to dispute management and avoidance is to live those contracts, not just enter into them. So just using that terminology and using the, the sorts of clauses that we see in NEC about acting with, with good faith and mutual trust and cooperation, that has to actually mean something in the way that the contract's operated to avoid disputes. So I don't think it's necessarily about the contract model. It's about parties' behaviours and how the contract is operated. 
All right, um, Angela Constance. Okay, thank you. I wondered if the panel had uh, any experience of whether or not the Building Scotland Fund has helped to improve <laughs> the availability of funding for the sector. And I wondered uh, whether, Mr Slesser, you might have some views on this. Um. <coughs> I took a little bit of a look at some of the figures, and up until the end of the current financial year, there's about £51 million pounds been allocated from the 150 that was set aside, and around half of that is on one project at Winchborough Developments. Um, so the, where we are in the, in the sector, that, that's helpful for us, because that's helped that project come to market much quicker than it maybe would have done in the past. Um, the challenge is um, the transparency and the visibility of how to access that fund, because there are a number of um, and constraints around it, which prevent you know many developers from accessing it. But in general, um, you know it's it's a good idea. It helps bring more projects to market, um, and I think it's a, probably a useful start towards the Scottish National Investment Bank mm -hmm. um, and, and understanding how that's going to be able to support uh, construction in, in infrastructure in Scotland in the next. 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and um, on that point, given that the uh, Building Scotland Fund was very much launched as a, a precursor mm -hmm. uh, to the National uh, Investment Bank, um, how do you expect the Improvement Bank to improve the sector's access to finance? Uh, the biggest challenge is going to be replaced in the European Investment Bank if it decides mm -hmm. not to invest heavily in Scotland post-Brexit, um, whatever shape that looks like. Over the last 10, 15 years, they've invested somewhere in the region of three billion in Scotland, delivering some of the largest infrastructure projects around. Um, and this, there's a two billion pot uh, being uh, you know, in, in place for the Scottish National Infrastructure Bank, which leaves a gap um, against what you would have hoped. Um, the other part of that is, is really about how that, the, the constraints that are put around that in order to satisfy, you know, accounting, you know, regulations in terms of whether it being on the books or off the books for for the for the government in terms of how it's funded. So um, for us, it's very much in the early stages. We're trying to understand what it will really mean. Our hope is that it will continue in some way, shape, or form to fill the gap left by the uh, European Investment Bank. Okay, thank you for that. And we've obviously heard that uh, the investment bank will take quite a, a mission-orientated approach. Is it your hope and expectation that there will be a, a very specific mission uh, around construction? It, it would be my certainly my hope, not necessarily my expectation. I mean, there's, the infrastructure bank has to cover lots of different things. Um, the, the one area where I think it could add real value is in the renewable sector and low-carbon economy. There's, there's a lot of opportunity in Scotland to be able to explore that, and I would like to see that the, the investment bank can help push it along in that direction. Okay, thank you for that. I wondered if any of our other panel members had anything to add to what Mr Slesser has commented upon. Nope. Okay, thank you. All right, um, John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. I think committees had quite a lot of uh, uh, comment from uh, people responding to the consultation about the subject of retentions. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you had uh, thoughts about that. I mean, could you paint a picture for us just now as to where we actually are with retentions? I mean, how common are they? What kind of percentages are we talking about? Because a long, long time ago, uh, I did auditing and it was pretty standard. And I think everyone just accepted that retentions were part of what happened. Uh, but has that changed over the years? Ms. Frame? Sure. So <clears throat> we typically see retention in practically every project, um, usual percentage between three and five uh, percent. Recently, I've heard of contracts where retention has been as high as 10 percent. Um, that seems particularly onerous. Um, and the usual mechanism, as you probably are aware, that half of the retention is released on practical completion and the other half at the end of the defect liability period. So that, if that was 10%, which was a bit unusual, um, what do you think happened there? I mean, was it the, did the presumably the contractor agreed to that and signed the agreement? Um, I, I don't know if that no. was agreed to or not. Um, I think it's the sort of clause that contractors would assess in terms of the risk profile of the contract and whether that was something they were prepared to take on in terms of their own working capital and cash flow requirements. I mean, that, that basically takes out any profit from the job and, and withholds it to a much later stage. It's very difficult for them 
to, to withhold as much as that and make the contract viable. Yes. I mean, I always thought that, you know, there was a certain logic to retention because then if work wasn't done properly or there was odds and ends to be tied up at the end, that gave the, um, the main organisation, be it private or public, a kind of hold over the contractor. Um, and is that not, or is that not accepted so much now as it used to be, that kind of logic? No, I think that logic does still apply. The, the question mark, I guess, is it's a very, it's a relatively small pot. Um, if the work's being properly managed, inspected as the work proceeds, there shouldn't be enormous amounts of defects left at practical completion. And the contract does provide for people to come back and rectify snagging. So you're left with the relatively small pot, but actually what's become a, a, a very big hot potato in terms of the headlines about the amounts of retention that are withheld. And that comes to bear when there's an insolvency and the retention fund is lost. Um, but things like the retention deposit scheme bill um, I'm not convinced are really the way forward and I think it maybe addresses a problem from one perspective but doesn't look at the whole issue in the round. Can you just clarify, is that a Westminster bill? It is, it's a private member's bill in yes. front of and Westminster. And would it apply to the whole of the UK or just to England? Um, I, I don't know. Okay, that's right. I mean, did either of the others want to come in at this point or I can ask more questions? I'd be happy to... Right, comment. Mr. Payton. Okay, yeah. Yep. Um, I think um, it's interesting um, listening to the, the example that, that, that Shona gave. I mean, certainly our experience is retentions are <coughs> on all the projects I'm involved in that there will be a retention normally three percent. But what we have seen recently is requests for higher retentions, and partly what seems to be driving that um, comes back to one of the earlier issues that we're discussing, which is uh, an anxiety um, amongst lenders uh, in relation to the construction sector and also bond providers. So um, some <coughs> contractors, I think, at a lower level are having difficulty obtaining performance bonds, which are typically for 10% of the contract sum and provide a, an element of performance security. And therefore, if the contractor is unable to obtain a performance bond, then uh, the client's next step may be to uh, ask for a higher retention. So is a performance bond, just for those of us that aren't too, too technical, um, is that a kind of alternative, really, in, in the sense, is it kind of an insurance policy? Is that how it works? It, it's uh, provided by a bank or a specialist bond provider, and essentially it's a, a, a pot of cash, essentially, that can be claimed um, if there's a default under the contract. But normally, on the projects we're involved in, there would be a retention, 3% retention and a 10% performance bond. Okay. Um, but if the contractor is unable to obtain a performance bond, then... Um, the client may seek to increase the retention to compensate for the lack of a performance bond. And has but that become more difficult to get a, re a performance bond in recent years? Um, certainly, anecdotally, yes, for, for contractors that the, you know, sort of SM, SME level, that's something that, that Stephen might be able to comment on. Um, but um, uh, but that, that just simply compounds the issue. You know, if retentions at 3% are a challenge in terms of cash flow, then you know, retention at 10% is, is obviously even more um, problematic. And I think um, it, it is quite interesting, um, uh, I think simply to do, away, to do away with retentions would, would leave the client uh, unprotected. So I think, you know, there are, there are alternatives and, and perhaps a more measured response is to, rather than to abolish retentions, is to, to find an alternative if possible, or, or maybe actually just to, to challenge bad practice because a retention serves a purpose and if properly used is, is legitimate but if it's an abusive retention and targeting the abuse perhaps that's a more a more focused uh, response. Right, I'm, I'm maybe come back to that point afterwards about the abuse uh, if I may. Uh, did you want to come in Mr. Slesser at that? Just a couple of points to, to support some of the discussions really there. I suppose just cards on the table. I'm definitely pro abolition of retention. I think it's a, a product of a yesteryear industry and as we move to more digital age where we can embrace technology such as blockchain and, and artificial intelligence that will help remove some of the client's concerns around quality and defects issues. Um, in reality, we, we'll often have to give performance bond, retention bond, parent company guarantee and have retention taken from us 
in order to undertake some contracts, and that's even in public sector as well as private sector. So there's there's three or four different methods available to um, clients if they wish to use them in order to provide financial security that doesn't impact necessarily on people's cash flow. And, and cash is really important, um, you know, and that's not just for tier ones, but all, all areas of the business. And, and the vast majority of defects, you know, that this pot of money is supposed to be held for are latent. You know, something that happily happens 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And uh, what happens in some large projects, you can have significant sums of money being held. Um, well, the employer's making, in better times, put some nice interest on that. Um, not so much in recent times, but, um, and then you do get some unscrupulous employers that will use it as a um, an advantage in agreeing final account sums. So, generally speaking, I'm definitely pro-abolition. Well, I mean, I suppose that's my next question then. Is, is everybody else basically pro-abolition of retentions? Is that the general feeling? I, I think the, the issues I see with retention are <clears throat> disputes around when it should be released and securing release, particularly of the second tranche of retention, which comes at the end of the defect liability period. So for main contractors we see a dispute around whether the conditions to allow that release have happened, and that would be rectification of any snagging works. But for subcontractors or tier twos, the issue is that their retention release is often linked to certifications up the line to the main contractor. Now, they're relatively small sums of money individually on projects, but when you add them up, if, if there's a lot of projects on, on the subcontractor's books, then it can add up to a large amount of cash. So in terms of access to a dispute mechanism which allows that to be released, it's, it's not economic because the cost of pursuing these small debts outweighs the sums at issue. But they are, they are a real issue in terms of bottom line and getting cash back in the bank once it's been withheld during a project. So, so if a, a retention wasn't being released and there wasn't a good reason, what, what are the options for the person looking for that retention? Is it, is it court or is it one of these arbitration systems? Um, so adjudication would be an option. So that's the fast track 28 day process. Um, or if it's small enough, uh, uh, it's not called small claim anymore, but the, the court procedure for smaller debts, that only applies, I think, to under £5,000. Um, it, it is tricky because there's a cost to adjudication. Um, the parties fund that themselves. There's no recovery of cost and they have to pay for the adjudicator. Um, so it is difficult when someone has a, like a, a, a list of retentions on their books to try and recover that. And particularly, as I say, when it's linked to certification up the line, it's something over which they have no control. So the defects in a very early subcontract might have been dealt with long ago, but if the main contractor's retention hasn't been released, then it's very difficult for the subcontractors to, re to get release of theirs. I think somebody suggested to us that even though there was an adjudication <coughs> process, that sometimes even after it's decided that, that still the, the payment is not made and then you still have to go to court and chase the payment. Is that, does that happen? That can happen. My experience is that most adjudication decisions are implemented. There's a small number of them which do go to the courts for enforcement procedures, um, but it tends to be for larger ones and where there's a real issue around the, the process or the jurisdiction of the adjudicator. The courts have set out their stall that they will enforce adjudication, adjudication decisions unless there's really very good reason not to. Thanks. And Mr Payton, you, you were the one that mentioned abuse of the, the, the kind of retention system before. Can you expand on that? or? Yeah, I think, um, you know, and to some extent, um, coming back to my original comment, you know, if there's pressure on um, cash flow, if there's low margins, uh, and, and high risk, that can lead to poor behaviour, I think, in, in some contractors, by certainly no means the majority, a, a minority, but it can lead to, to poor behaviours in terms of keeping their own business afloat um, that actually um, 
retention can be a, a means of, of of making it to the end of the week. Um, so um, I, I suspect um, uh, the poor practice is not it's not the majority; it's a minority, and in some to some extent, I think it's driven by by financial necessity. Um, the, the other interesting, obviously, the the private members uh, bill in relation to retention deposit schemes. Um, that's interesting. It's not the detail of it's not particularly well developed because I think it anticipates that there'll be uh, detailed kind of statutory instruments in, in in the various territories to to cover the implementation of it. But I suppose that um, at the other end of the spectrum creates quite an interesting um, issue in the sense that if retentions as a concept are going to exist, whether it's in the form of a cash retention or a retention deposit scheme, I suppose the very big difference for the client would be that in a retention deposit scheme, um, they would have to draw down the cash and put it into the deposit scheme. So, for example, if, you, if it's a developer taking bank funding, um, then they're drawing down that bank funding sooner and placing it in the and, and, and ring fencing it within that deposit scheme, which I suppose will add to the overall cost of the project. But but I can quite understand why you know contractors would say, well, that that should be the client's issue and the contractors shouldn't be funding the project. So it would make it safer in one sense, but it, it could actually push, I think someone suggested it could push up the cost yes. of the overall project. Yes, yes. because yes. you know, if, uh, if you're taking uh, funding, you're drawing it down sooner and the interest costs are running at an earlier date. But, but equally, you know, perhaps that is a, is a fair outcome from a contractor perspective rather than them funding the 3% for the, for the duration of the project. Right. OK, thanks very much. If I could just follow up one point on that, um, the abolitionist position, as it were, to get rid of the retentions altogether. Um, Mr. Slesser, do you not feel that could um, go against smaller firms? Because if you, I mean, obviously the, or the client presumably has to have some security for seeing the project actually completed, and smaller firms might be less well-placed to actually get the, the required bond or the cost would be prohibitive. I think in order to get past some of that, we need to take a more long-term view of uh, and wider view of the sector, and, and that comes down to how we procure things. Uh, and if we are looking to engage with SMEs and a supply chain across Scotland that we want to be fair to, uh, and in my mind that includes the abolition of retention is part of the question, then we need to have uh, a, a, a framework or a, a way of uh, working with SMEs that now allows them to grow allows them to build resources and capability, but allows them to bid and maintain for work. So it, it, we need to take a more uh, mature approach to procurement in, around SMEs to be able to facilitate that. In order to ensure that the client's still getting protection uh, from SMEs uh, in that instance, um, bonds are available. It doesn't necessarily need to be a performance bond. There are retention bonds that are available which can be procured. In some instances, it may just be that if we are if we if we st still have retention, having that sort of fiduciary trust that the re retention deposits bill talks about may help because one of the the biggest issues is insolvency, especially if they're a subcontractor to a tier one. For tier one, and I'll use the Kirlian example, there's a lot of subcontractors where they would have been in a much better place because that money would have been held in a trust that would have been able to access. That to me is the only real benefit of that. Um, again. If we want a mature uh, industry that's going to develop and deliver the infrastructure needs for Scotland in the next 25 years, then we need to start having a more mature discussion about how we treat our supply chain and the expectation that you know they're not going to come back and rectify a defect um, is part of that discussion because if they are here for the long term and they are a local SME, of course they're going to come back and, and repair that defect. Well, we'll come down to Colin BT. Thank you, Mira. Um how prevalent are late payments in this sector, and how much of a problem is that? Happy to start a few. <laughs> um, so I, I deal with construction disputes. So um, a lot of the cases I deal with are to do with payment. I, I don't know whether it's late payment. The ones I see are more around disputed levels of payment. Um, the the industry is very heavily regulated through the, the construction 
Act in terms of payment procedures that flows through to the standard forms of contract. So, so what I see is more around disputed values rather than timing. Do any of the other members of the panel have a view? Disputes. Um, it, it it generally is around values. Um, I think um, again. I suppose um, the issue about delayed payment again. Well, um, that can be used. I suppose up the contractual chain as a means of improving cash flow. Um, so if there's a, a th you know a thirty day payment period at one level and a longer payment period at other, then that does have a cash flow. Uh, cash flow benefits. I mean, given that we have been uh, advised that it is a problem in the industry, particularly the larger contractors, perhaps delaying payments to subcontractors, which are perhaps less able to absorb that sort of delay, do you think there's an effective and accessible adjudication process to deal with that? I think that um, you raise some legitimate points, and I think um, it would be wrong of me to sit here and say there aren't payment problems within the industry. There are. Um, that's not to say that it, there aren't things that are being done to help that. Um, from my own experience, that um, I agree with, with uh, Shona that most adjudications and disputes relate to the value of the payments rather than actually being paid themselves. Uh, it, where you have difficulty in getting paid on time, Adjudications are one potential way of dealing with that. However, in, in my view, and um, no disrespect to my learned colleagues to the left of me, but solicitors, solicitors in general seem to have hijacked the adjudication process over the last 10 years. Uh, and what should have been a relatively simple, short and sharp way of obtaining cash or putting it in the, in the place where the person who believes they own it has become a drawn out affair which can cost significant amounts of money by having to have representation at adjudications, adjudication fees going through the roof. And, you know, it's just not a real viable alternative for these days for those that are chasing cash. So while it has a, has a purpose and it's a perfectly excellent way of resolving some disputes, um, in terms of payment and getting cash early, I don't think adjudication is suitable for that. And yet Mr Bunton, in, in his submission to the committee, states that uh, you know, the issues he's dealing with are the worst in 20 years and you know, in terms of the level and the value of the adjudication. So that would imply that adjudications are going up fairly significantly. And I think the, I read Mr Bunton's paper with, with some interest and, and a couple of observations around it would be that the, the payment disputes he refers to are those actually dis dis uh, on the sums due. And largely that is really comes from um, two reasons. One, the, the, the types of risk that contractors were once willing to take and no longer willing to take and how those risks have been managed. And two, um, that the initial budgets just are, are wrong. And contractors being the way they are will always try and get to the lowest price because that's how procurement in Scotland is driven. And so, you know, in so far as where Mr Bunton's report gets to, they're the conclusions you can draw as the root causes of that. In terms of actual speed of payment, I don't believe that adjudications that he refers to are around about speed of payment. I think it's more the, the, the quantum of what the payment should be. Given that we've had a, quite a number of witnesses over, over the weeks uh, referring to late payments as being an issue, especially for the, the smaller contractors, how much leverage does the small contractor have with the main contractor in extracting payment? Generally speaking, in my experience, quite a lot, because we rely, especially in Scotland, on our regional supply chain to be able to deliver works for us. So if you're working in, in some of the more rural parts of Scotland, there's no chance that we can, one, keep our credibility for delivery, or two, be able to go back and do repeat business if we can't work with the supply chain there. You know, it's a, sim it's a symbiotic relationship, and there's a lot of mutual respect between us. I mean, in the part of the business that I work in, we self-deliver a lot of our work, so we directly deliver. So we don't use a great deal of subcontractors, and most of the work is, uh, when we do use subcontractors, on a specialist regional basis to help support that. So, you know, my experience has been that they do have a lot of leverage. And still we hear that uh, it's a problem for them in getting payment. Uh, I'm not saying it's across the board. Yeah. No, I'm no, and, and, and uh, I, I totally accept that. I'm not saying, I'm just giving you what my experiences mm. are. 
in terms of um, the, you know the wider supply chain SMEs, yes, there are contractors there that don't are unscrupulous or treat the supply chain with disdain. Some have financing schemes. I'm not saying that there are, everybody has the same principles as we do, but you know there is a, a challenge there that needs to be addressed. I don't get the feeling from the panel that uh, there is a general concern about late payments. Well, at the risk of repeating <laughs> my own voice, I've seen I'm doing a lot of speaking, but I think for me, there is a concern for us of late payments, even at our sector, because some of the payments that we get from public sector clients are late, you know, and that puts pressure on our cash flow because we're still expected to pay our supply chain within 30 days, and which in, when we're working on, on large projects, we, we can generally do. But there are times where, you know, we'll have some disagreements over the value of those payments. And sometimes SMEs feel that the disagreements over value also relate to the speed of payment. So I think you need to separate the distinction between what the true value of the work is and how quickly it should be paid. Do you think the public sector uh, acts fairly in terms of uh, how it uh, schedules its payments? Generally, yes, but there are some specific instances where some uh, elements of the public sector seem to treat uh, construction companies as an additional revenue stream. Can you say which part of the public sector? Not, not specifically, but in so far as we have to finance uh, projects for certain amounts of time, so as we discussed earlier, we're effectively financing projects for 60 to 90 days in some instances. Well, which in terms of a public sector contract can be a fairly large sum of money. It can be. Are there particular areas of the public sector which are... Uh, there's no particular area you know, that I could give you any observations on, but what I could say is where we work collaboratively with people like the Hub and Scottish Water, we find we have a really good relationship with them and, the, and you know, payment is not a problem. They have some great practices there and there's a lot that others could learn from them. I'll let you off the hook on that. Thank one. you very much, Thank Mr. You. Beattie. <laughs> may, I, may I ask a question then slightly different on the same line? Um, what are the, the reasons given or for late payment when it involves the public sector? I mean, are there legitimate reasons why late payment occurs sometimes? Are you able to comment on that, what the the reason given for that sort of thing is? Uh, generally speaking, in, uh, there are usually some reasons behind it. You know, there's often it's because there's a funding decision where they've entered <coughs> a contract and they're waiting for a funding to come through or they've got to spend so much money within the, the financial year. So there's, there's no really set trend in, in my view. Yeah, sure. So I was going to pick up on the point regarding that the, there's a legal framework in terms of protection for contractors and subcontractors, um, in addition to the relationship points which Stephen was mentioning. And it's, it's an industry where there's been an enormous amount of innovation in terms of implying terms and forcing terms into construction contracts. So we saw that through the Housing Grants Act. In, in application from 1998 that was tightened up in 2011 with the Local Democracy Act. Um, these apply equally in Scotland. So in terms of the structure of payments, payment notices, pay less notices, and the whole certainty over payment, there, there is regulation in place that deals with all of these backed up by adjudication as the dispute resolution method, which is at least cheaper and quicker than the alternatives. Um, I'm not convinced that more regulation is the way forward. And I think just picking up on Stephen's point, the, the whole way that people work together and really leadership coming from, from government, from public sector bodies, to not just talk about better payment practices, but actually put these in place um, is, is going to be more of a way forward than more legal remedies and more contractual remedies. I think, um, th thank you. Um, certainly what um, we, we have uh, experienced in the past is that, you know, um, at every stage in the at every step in the chain there there can be issues uh, with with payment um and in some instances those do, do arise at you know kind of the client level at, at the public sector level I, I do think sometimes that is 
as a consequence of there perhaps being um, a level of a, a lack of skills or under resourcing um, to, to properly manage uh, and administer these contracts because the, the, the contracts that are put in place for high value projects are generally quite detailed, generally quite complex and require a reasonable amount of management and administration. Um, and, and it's important, I think, you know, we talk about skills at a kind of apprentice level, but equally skills at the, at the client level in terms of having the skills and the resource available to properly manage and implement contracts. And, and if that's not there, that can lead um, to, to issues with payment, for example. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. And to project bank accounts, because I think it's fair to say the majority of submissions that the committee received <coughs> question the effectiveness of project bank accounts um, in improving cash flow and payment issues. Um, I wonder if I could ask you your, your views on project bank accounts. Um, and I'm conscious that the threshold was four million. Um, and I don't think one project bank account was used when it was at that threshold. It's now two million. Do you think that will help? I'm happy to start anyway. Gavin Payton. Um, certainly. Um, what we have um, experienced uh, even prior to the re reduction in the threshold um, was um, the, the relatively new uh, to the Scottish market, it, it, you know, in relative terms. And there's still quite a lot of um, work going on uh, on all sides with parties wrestling with the implementation of them. And that's, that's not a comment on whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. It's simply the practicalities of, of dealing with them that's still being uh, wrestled with. And uh, certainly, um, what we are hearing is that, you know, well, clearly there's a cost associated with setting up and implementing a project bank account, which, which wouldn't exist if, if, if they weren't being used. Uh, and also, um, the introduction of project bank accounts has an impact on cash flow. Um, you don't have the large chunk of cash passing down through the supply chain. It's, it's going around the main contractor and around the, the second tier contractors. And I suppose that recognising that, well, okay, if the previous model was um, that the cash all did flow through the main contractor, then if you if you take that cash flow away uh, and you've got a low margin, you know, that has an impact on, on their business. And, you know, that's that's not a criticism, that's just reality. If the cash is no longer flowing through, it has an impact on them. And it's whether actually there's a, a recognition that, um, that that cash flow disbenefit to the main contractor will be reflected in, you know, in the, in the pricing uh, of, 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 the, of the job. Um, I think with the reduction in the threshold, I mean, clearly, uh, if the guidance is complied with, then that will lead to the greater use of project bank accounts. But, but I suppose the setup costs and the operating costs of a project bank account don't directly relate to the scale of the project. So I suppose to some extent, reducing the threshold compounds the issue of the cost of setting up and implementing the project bank account because of a lower value project it can less sustain the, the cost associated with setting up and operating the, the project bank account. What, what percentage of a contract would it normally cost to set up a project bank account? I couldn't comment on the percentage. No. So, so no. you don't know what, what the relative cost would no. be? No. no. Okay. No. Shona Frame? Yeah, just maybe three points on project bank accounts. Firstly, I think just echoing Gavin, the increased level of administrative burden on the people operating these um, and making sure that the correct amount of money flows to the correct people at the right time is probably more complex than is appreciated. The, the second point is around the interaction of time scales. So the Construction Act, the scheme and standard form building contracts have specified time scales for payments for issue of payment notices, which are mandatory for issue of pay less notices in advance of the final date for payment. And when you overlay them onto the, the drawdown dates for trying to extract money from a project bank account, that whole timeline becomes quite complex. And when you're operating on the 17 day fair payment guidance, it's it's actually very difficult to make these time scales work properly. Um, so there's a sort of practical consequence around use of project bank accounts. And then the third point again is this removal of working capital 
from the supply chain. So th there, is, there tends to be a gap between payments coming in and going back out again to flow down the supply chain. And that period of time where the money is sitting with the party, it's using that money as working capital. And if that's removed from the equation, in a circumstance where people are working on very low margins um, with low pricing, um, taking on high levels of risk, you're, you're almost creating a perfect storm in the market when you do something like that. Mm. Okay. Mr Slesser. I, I couldn't summarise it better than, than Shona, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, for us, if we have no cash buffer, the rate of failure will rise and uh, margins will need to go up to compensate mm. for that. So, nothing for the given, time. Given that it isn't the, the magic bullet that some people would hope it would be, um, give me your top measure to improve um, financial management of construction projects. What's your, what would you recommend to government if you had the ability to tell them, do this and that might fix the problem? Set a realistic budget at the very outset instead of constantly trying to value engineer savings that don't exist. Okay. Are you going to agree with Mr Slesson? <laughs> I'll add a, a different point, Good. which is around looking at the whole life cycle of the asset. So not capital cost of the build, but what is the cost over the entire life cycle? So lowest cost for the capital expenditure of the build is not necessarily best value when you look at the whole life cycle. If you have low cost, there may well be an impact on quality and over the length of the asset, it might end up costing more. So I think looking at sort of inception right through to end of life of the asset is what I would suggest that we look at more closely. Okay. Mr Patton. Um, taking a bit of a sideways step, I suppose, you know, if, if project bank accounts are challenging, problematic, I mean, if you looked at different procurement routes, um, you know, design and build, um, you know, is, is, a, is a big focus at the moment and that involves obviously uh, main contractor, subcontractors and, 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 and the, the cash flowing that way. Um, there are other procurement routes available, uh, construction management um, being one of them. And I suppose that um, you can't have the tail wagging the dog, but if you adopted a construction management procurement route, then um, the, the importance of project bank accounts would be, would be less significant. Okay. Um, but that's, that, that's, to some extent, the tail wagging the dog. Mm. Um, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions from committee members? Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. We, we've heard about the challenges facing the sector. Very briefly, what, what do you see as being the main opportunities for growth in the sector? And can I ask um, how the sector in Scotland can take advantage of the, the UK uh, construction sector deal? Um, there are figures of £600 billion of investment coming through the pipeline in the next uh, 10 years. For me, um, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, digital <coughs> construction and adopting digital ways of uh, operating is, is the one massive opportunity that the industry in Scotland has. Uh, digital technologies such as robotics, blockchain, artificial intelligence, um, you know, we need to be able to invest and, and research them and actually harness them to be able to deliver the kind of infrastructure that Scotland deserves in the future. Um, in order to do that, um, as contractors, we need a strong pipeline of work to be able to invest. Um, and the, uh, the, the wider UK construction industry deal is something that we're already uh, we're looking at in, in some detail. We've got a number of projects around robotics and, and artificial intelligence that we're looking to deliver in Scotland. Uh, as part of our commitment to working here um, and and for me we need to move away from this fixation on lowest price piecemeal bidding uh, and concentrate on um, on the more qualitative aspects of what um, construction can bring and outside of digital construction the other sort of big win for me in terms of opportunity is what we can do in social value uh, and community benefits procurement can be a really powerful tool for obtaining uh, great social value benefits um, and we really need to sort of start assessing uh, how we deliver projects on a wider scale than just lowest cost, but take into account those things. Thank you. Do either of the other panel members have views in terms of the UK uh, sector deal? Yes. 
um, not the sector deals so much okay. as the you asked about opportunities mm. for growth as well. Um, we we did some research in my firm uh, amongst main contractors in the UK. We we approached 150 main contractors and the the opportunities that they see, and this is coming from the marketplace, is very much around the themes of innovation and technology. Um, the, that is seen as a, a very real way to achieve benefits mm. in cost savings, in quality improvements, and in just a better built environment. So that was something that came out strongly. Um, and in terms of how that can be achieved across the sector, the, the big theme coming out was collaboration and the need for partnership um, in the approach to delivering projects. I think the only thing I would, I would add to that um, is that uh, it's in relation to off-site um, manufacturing yeah. and you know we've talked uh, on various occasions today about the, the high risk associated with um, construction projects. Part of that arises because they are implemented in uncontrolled environments to an extent, mm -hmm. weather related particularly. And um, I suppose the, the hope is that um, off-site uh, manufacturing, you know, should help to increase, you know, productivity. Um, should help to improve quality, um, and also perhaps helps with with program certainty. Mm. Um, I think um, I think that follows, but to really ramp up in terms of offsite manufacturing, that that requires quite significant investment. Uh, and I suppose to achieve that, then there need to be the, the environment that that supports that investment. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Well, if there are no further questions from com committee members, uh, may I thank all, all of our witnesses today. Thank you for coming in. Um, we'll be moving straight into another item, so please feel free to um, uh, leave us to car carry on with that, if I can put it that way. And thank you again for coming in today. Thank you. <coughs> um, the next um, item on the agenda is number three, which relates to the geo-blocking regulation revocation EU exit regulations 2019. The, com the committee has been asked to consider a notification from the Scottish Government relating to the geo-blocking regulations, which prohibit certain forms of discrimination encountered by customers buying certain goods and services from traders in the EU. This applies regardless of whether the sale is processed online or offline, or if the customer is a consumer or a business. In the event of a no-deal exit from the EU, preserving the geo-blocking regulation would, with reference to reserve matters, mean that UK businesses would retain the same obligations to EU customers under UK law, while UK customers would have a substantial loss of protection. This is because UK customers would be outside the EU internal market, meaning EU traders would not retain the same obligations. Repealing the geo-blocking regulation will ensure that UK businesses are not subject to non-reciprocal demands which would act as a burden without any benefit for both UK businesses and customers. At its last meeting, the committee agreed to seek further information on the regulations and the response to that is contained in members' papers. Is the committee content for these issues to be dealt with by statutory instrument laid at Westminster? Yes. As the committee is content, I will write to the Cabinet Secretary to notify him of the committee's decision. I'll now suspend the meeting and move to private session. <laughs>